Thank you, brother. እግዚአብሔር <laughs> Like Hana Mister, Hawina, Diakonat, all of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are purchased by His precious blood, may God grant you all to live long and to live well. So, <laughs> there are so many things that we can talk about and discuss. I won't take too much of your time already, although we were encouraged by Kasis to keep going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny, but for our religion, for our right religion, for that right path. And indeed, you could learn to practice this gradually, as one of our sisters, Beit Lehen, mentioned yesterday in the Q&A panel that we have. The spiritual life is not something that you try to do all at once. It's not like you can just go from zero to 100 super, super quickly. You need to incrementally and gradually take steps. She mentioned that if you're trying to wake up early for Kaddasi, don't try to come at 1 a.m. the first time, unless you're really good. If you could really do that, obviously it's amazing. But if you can't, try coming 15 minutes earlier every time. And then if you keep that up consistently over a number of weeks, you'll be surprised at how much you're able to do eventually. So, yesterday also one of the things that Kassiz Nehemiah had mentioned was that, uh, in the Q&A, that when we are trying to interpret the scriptures for ourselves, this was for a group of people who wanted to know how do we do this if we don't have clergy around us. Obviously, the best case scenario is if you have your patriarch or if you're bishop and keep going down the line until you get to deacons and local Sunday school teachers. But if you don't have all that before you, you need some tools, some instruments to help you, some lenses that help you interpret the Holy Scriptures. And today, that's my goal. Yesterday, we talked about how Christianity is defined in contradistinction with or as the opposite of the world. Christianity is hope when the world offers despondency and hopelessness. So I want you to remember that and that Christianity is fundamentally Greco-Syrian. It's Greek and it's Semitic. But emphasis on the latter part, Semitic, and also I said as Aksumites or people of the Gizrite tradition of Alexandria, we also have our own things to contribute through Kaddasi, through Zema, through Kane, and through Mas'ayv, or through our Eucharistic and non-Eucharistic liturgies, liturgies with and without Kurban, with our original poetry that we use to submit ourselves to the Lord, and also with the commentaries of the fathers that we should be adding to in this very day by first listening to the voice of the church across time and place, across all the centuries and across all the continents, the universal church as she's revealed to us in our local communities. So today I want to focus on this distinction between how we are still Greek but how we are still Semitic. And sometimes when we lean too much on the Greek side, some Greek philosophy sneaks in and when it sneaks in, we forget the world view of all the authors. Even though the New Testament was written in Greek, uh, the Greek language, the world view of them was highly shaped about by their Semitic languages. And although we don't boast in any seed or zer or race that we have, like Father Nehemiah said earlier, we only boast in what the Lord has given us, the living seed, the seed of Abraham, the seed from the root of Jesse, the seed of David, the seed of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We still have a slight advantage in the race by being of Semitic background to help us understand some things. So in the Platonic world, in the Greek world, the world of Plato, people try to lift up the greatness of the human being. They try to make the human being the center of the universe. And in God's world, the human being is nowhere near the center of the universe because the Lord is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And the heavens and the earth are themselves children of the Lord. Within that, you have different who lived or generations, including the human beings, but also the animals. And so you have to remember that all of the creation belongs to the Lord. And so in order to make ourselves humble, we have to remember one small little tidbit. What was the name of Paul himself? When Paul had his name changed, as Father Nehemiah said, when you become a Christian, your name is changed. 
when his name changed from Saul, he was Sa'al, to be asked for, right? Just like the first king of Israel that was asked for. He changed his name to Paulos or to Paul. Paul might not mean anything to anyone here, but in its time and in its place, it has a specific meaning. It means diminutive one, little one. And even that, you might not understand. So let me put it this way for you. Imagine if the Amharic Bible was translated, and everywhere where the name Paulos was, or Paul, it said Mamush. Then, try to say the great Mamush. How silly would that sound? You know how that sounds. And so I'll give you one quick reminder from an Orthodox priest, Father Paul Tarazi, that I really liked. He said he was a, he's a confessing of father, and so someone came to him for confession, and they said, Father, how can I grow in humility? And he said, my son, you cannot grow into humility. You must shrink. You cannot grow. You must shrink. You must become a mamush. You must become littler. You can't be growing. If you want to become humble, you have to be lowly. Maritachin, Our Lady, in her prayer, called the Magnificat, where she blessed the Lord. She said, my life breath or my breath of life magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She said, he has looked upon the lowliness, the humility, the tithanna, the lowliness. They have to be low to the ground in order to live. So that, that lens of being lowly will help us out to interpret scripture and will help us understand things in context rather than things in the abstract. So the, the key terms I'm going to give you, and remember, don't be afraid of new words. Whenever we're in science class or history class or English class, we learn new words, so we can learn new words at church too. We have abstractions in Greek philosophy, and in the Semitic understanding, we have something called functionality. Can everyone say functionality? If those of, you, those of you who are into strength training or fitness as well will know that there's the word functional is used in that sense too. It's even in American sayings as well, like function, function over form. It's a word that we hear a lot. It's the use, right? The usefulness, the, the being a tool or being an instrument. So it's not about the, the action like in isolation. It's about what can that tool or instrument be used for. And I want us to, to realize this as the difference between kanafir and gabir, between lips and between action. A lot of times we have idioms in the English language, and I want you to know the idioms or sayings of the English language, almost 90% or more come from the King James Bible, so they come from the biblical tradition. And without knowing it, people are talking about things in the Bible. Um, where I'm from in LA, it might be less so, but I imagine here in Houston, Texas, people have the name of God on their lips a little bit more than in Hollywood. And the idea of lip service is something I think that a lot of us kind of intuitively know what it means, but we might not know that it comes from the Bible. So I'm going to contextualize lip service from the Bible, from Isaiah first, because we're still in Soma Nabiat, or the, the prophets fast, and then we're going to move into the Gospel of Matthew to show you that anyone who tries to think that the Older Testament is irrelevant and they try to just focus on the New Testament is bringing you something that is an incomplete message. Because everywhere in the New Testament, they're constantly quoting the Older Testament and synthesizing it. And I'll show you that a little bit later as well. So what is lip service? Let's see in Isaiah chapter 29, from verses 13 to 16. Isaiah 29, 13 to 16. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment of men learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will again do marvelous things with this people, wonderful and marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hid. And again, in Matthew chapter 15, in verses 1 to 9, we see this passage from Isaiah quoted. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what would you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. 
For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So now we're going to jump back into the idea of abstraction versus functionality. Usually we think of things as essentially true. We love the word essential. That whole concept comes from Plato, not from the church. We think something is that way all the time and everywhere. But everywhere in scripture, we find interpretation. We find Audanibabu, or the context. And through the Audanibab, or through the context, we're able to understand how to do the right thing and what tools and instruments are to be used. So I have a few questions for you, and some of them may seem obvious, some of them may not, but there should be a common theme between them. So is the cross a bad thing or a good thing? It's a good thing? Everyone agrees it's a good thing? Okay, we'll come back to that. Pharaonic chance, or if you want, Yafaron Zema. Is it good or bad? Pharaonic chance. What do you think? You found Zima. Toro no itafuta. I tafuta. Then no. We'll come back to that too. How about lions? Are lions, according to the Bible, good things or bad things? They're good. They're good. Okay. How about serpents? Snakes. Are snakes good or bad in the Bible? They're bad. Okay. We'll come back to it. Plato is a tricky devil. So, so, let's start off with the cross. The cross did not originally belong to Christianity. The cross was a tool or an instrument of the Roman Empire and the Greeks before them. And the cross was the way people were put to death. It's not simply a way in which people were put to death. It is the most shameful, humiliating, and excruciatingly painful way in which people were put to death. There were sometimes miles of thousands of people that would be crucified. There were islands that were conquered where people would be crucified. And the message was simple. If you disobey Rome, if you disobey Caesar, you will be put to death. You will be executed. And because you are afraid of being put to death, Caesar and Rome have control over you. And so you will be obedient, or this is what will happen to you. Our Lord came, and he said, that's cool. Let me show you this. I'm going to flip your own ideology on your head. You think this is powerful? You think you could line up thousands of people? and just have them murdered and executed? Well, how about if I let you do it? I can bring all my angels and wipe you out. But what if instead of doing that, I let you put me to death to show you how much I love even you, how much I love the entire world. And in this day and age, in the 21st century, we don't even remember what fear of death or fear of darkness what control the cross had in that time and place. Why? Because his power overpowered it. In Ephesians, Paul talks about what the, Iwa, the Evangelion, or the gospel, the good news is preached. It's like someone coming out and having Sibkat, which today is, by the way, one of the Nusan Ba'alat, or one of the small holidays in preparation for Christmas. Sibkat means a preaching or an announcement or a heralding. Like the early 20th century heralds who used to say extra, extra, read all about it. Except in this time and place, the people who would announce and would be front runners to tell the good news would talk about the victory of Caesar. Instead, they got defeat. And who got victory but our Lord. So that today, what is remembered is not the power of Rome, but the power of our Lord Jesus. So the cross is not good and it's not bad. It's functional. It's how it was used. The Lord used the cross 
because it was an instrument to glorify his name, to lift his name on high. So the Pharaoh one is a little tricky. If you go to the Coptic church, which is of course very intersected and tied with our own, during their Siklat or their Good Friday, they have a hymn called Golgotha for the place of the skull. And the hymn that they use, the words are all about the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and eventually his resurrection. But the zema they use, the melody they use, is what the pharaohs were buried with in their Ba'adam Lakum, in their old pharaonic Egyptian hieroglyphic religion. It's the same melody they used to bury pharaohs with, and they converted that melody into the burial of Christ. I went there uh, one time for a Good Friday, and it was amazing to hear Egyptians singing in their midnight praises. Oh Lord, thank you for burying Pharaoh and all of his chariots. Can you imagine them saying that about an Ethiopian king and their chariots? It's, a, it's an amazing amount of self-sacrifice. But for the glory of the Lord, that place which is so demonized in scripture, Egypt, submitted unto Christ. As, as we say when we're singing Sarawitha and Kaddasi, or about the heavenly and bodiless, bodiless hosts. So now we have to go to lions. Now to get to lions, we're going to have to go back to the scriptures. So now we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 8 to 11. So here, we're going to see lions that are bad. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. So the devil in the Bible is a lion. I think I know someone else who's called a lion in the Bible. I don't know if you can guess yet or if you already know. So now we're in Yohannes Rai or John's Revelation chapter 5 from the beginning. And I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I wept much that no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders, one of the Kainata Sabai, said to me, weep not. Lo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders or presbyters, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders or presbyters fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, and with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the scroll and to open its seal. For thou wast slain, and by the blood didst ransom men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. So, lions are functional. They're neither good nor bad. They're used for Masonic. They're used for illustrative language to instruct the people. They're not by themselves good or bad. This last one may surprise us but, but it's so obvious to us that I think we have to look at it a second time. So the reason I think so many of you said the snake was bad is because of Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, from verses 1 to 14, you have the, the serpent who runs around. Because you're so familiar with it, we'll go to something that is maybe a little less familiar. We'll go to numbers today. So if you go to Genesis 3, that'll be your homework to reread why you thought the snake was so bad. And there it'll tell us about a very bad snake indeed. But in Numbers, we find a good snake. 
And so we have to grapple with that. We have to figure out, I thought snakes were bad. We have to figure out what's going on. So in Numbers 21, verses 1 to 9, it goes like this. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who dwelt in the Najib, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Abraham, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed give this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of the place was called Horma. From Mount Hor they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. See, some bad snakes. And then they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit, and if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. We know this because, again, the New Testament is inherently linked to the Older Testament. And when we go to the Gospel of John, which is to be the final verse I read for us, chapter 3, it's a verse, uh, set of verses we commonly read during the baptism. Whenever there's Christian not for babies, we typically read the general vicinity here. But we're looking right now for just our purposes, 14 to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we all think about the Bible says snakes are bad, and we're right. The Bible does say snakes are bad, but also uses the snake to say that the snake on the stick was a foreshadowing of Christ who was to go on the stick or the tree of the cross. So we know that crosses are functional. We know that pharaonic chants or yafaron zema is functional. We know that serpents or snakes are functional and lions are functional. Whatever tool we have, whatever instrument we have, like we talked about yesterday, in discussing what we can do with podcasts and for some of the younger folks who are more hip to TikTok could use TikTok and other digital means to glorify the Lord. Whatever you are doing, wherever you are going, in whatever time or place you are in, you can glorify the Lord. The same teaching and functionality is found in one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry in the English language. In Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, he says, What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. It means whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. My own name, Henok, I've seen spelled a million different ways. My parents decided to spell it H-E-N-O-K in English. Obviously, in Bagus, there's only one way, and then no and then could. But in English, they did H-E-N-O-K. Some people do a C-H. Some people leave out the H when they translate it to English. The original Hebrew, they had it like Hanok. And then some people even before then had just the, the consonants, H, N, and K. What matters is that character and that story is either the son of Cain or the son of Yared. There are two Henoks in the Older Testament. The son of Cain and the son of Yared, right, or Jared. And the son of Cain is not the one that I want to be. They're both named the dedicated man or the devoted man. But the one that we want to follow, the one that is in our lineage, the great-grandfather of Noah, is the son of Jared, and so that's the one we want to follow. My brother Diakon Susnios, who invited me here today, some of you might know him as Diakon Susnios, or Diakon Kuku, or Diakon Iyasu. Whatever you know him by, what matters is that he invited one of his friends to share a word of life or a kalahiwit with you. It doesn't matter which one you call him. Now, obviously, ask his preference, but what matters is the function. We are called Diakonats. We're also deacons. The original is diakonos. 
Yesterday, our brother deacon, or Diakon Yonatan, was explaining to everybody, if you read Acts chapter 6 and 7, you see the original seven deacons, and they were there to prepare what for the people when they were having beef in their community, and they were there to squash that beef, to manage that conflict, to resolve those disputes, to make peace amongst the people, so that the apostles could focus on the word of God. And then within two seconds, Stephanos Kadame Samait, Kadame Deacon, was martyred for preaching the word without shame. So not only did he prepare the what, but he also preached the word. So fundamentally, deacons are table servants and waiters. Father Nehemiah also warned us in the Bible studies yesterday that if you want to have a deacon, you don't just have a deacon because they may lead you astray. You have to have a functional deacon. Just being a deacon doesn't make you righteous or on the right path or in orthodoxy. You have to be following the education of the vast ocean and we have to examine it. We have to examine everything within it to find what we can do. Our Lady, to keep giving you examples, is called Mariam. She's called Kaddis Dengel Sion. Yesterday we're at Kedana Mirat. Today we're at Ba'ata La Mariam. She has so many names, right? The, the Covenant of Mercy, the Entrance of the Theotokos, or the Mother of God, the Virgin, the Holy Woman. There's so many names she has, but the thing, right, the kin to the seed of the mother of the living, or if you want, the kin to humankind. She has so many names, but with all of her names, what's important is that she lived a humble life and that she prays on our behalf so that we too can be lowly as she was a lowly servant of our Lord. And finally, we have the name of God. So now it will take us actually back to Genesis and close out. So in Genesis 3, the same, or excuse me, in Exodus 3, when Moses is approaching the Lord, he's trying to see what he should call him. And here is the response of God to which the Jehovah's Witnesses have gone and created a whole other denomination for no reason. But uh, here, here it is, the name of the Lord when asked. Exodus chapter 3 from verses 13 to 16, and we'll, we'll close. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. God had also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So, we tried to see what his name was. We tried to see what it was. And what we're given is what's called in scholarship the Tetragram. Y W. H. And then people try to vocalize it and they say Jehovah and they try to argue with you. Don't even argue with him. Tell them even the Lord's name is functional. That's what he's trying to say. Don't get caught up on my name. My name doesn't matter to you. Whether you call me Adonai, my Lord, or you call me Yahweh or Elohim or Ixabhir or Getachin or our Lord, our God, whatever you call me, the thing that he doesn't want is lip service. Not everyone that says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter into his kingdom. He does not want lip service. He wants actions. He wants the holiness of your thoughts, the holiness of your words, and the holiness of your actions or deeds in all times and in all places. May the Lord make us all functional and joyfully and solemnly ready to prepare to celebrate his nativity or his birthday in a few weeks. Enjoy the rest of Sivkat or the heralding and next week's Berhan or light and finally the Nolawi or the shepherd as we prepare for Berhan al-Dhatakristos wa sabat al-Xavier.